good morning, and thank you uh, for the kind introduction. DPM Hung, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have a few very s simple comments and one simple message. Uh, as was alluded to, I've been kind of dedicating my life for the last 20 years after leaving Goldman Sachs to China, the rise of China, the relationship between China and the United States, China and the world. And at one point, it seemed as though the trajectory was very smooth and clear. And recently, it's become not so clear and not so smooth. And uh, I struggle in my own country to understand how to talk about this topic and get oxygen in the room and get people to listen. And it's very, very difficult. So I've taken recently to saying, well, let's look at the world in 2050. That's far enough away that people will be less emotional, but near enough to be real. And in doing that, I've said to myself, what will the world look like in 2050? And the best estimates are there'll be something like 10 billion people. And today there are 8 billion. So we're going to add 2 billion people. It turns out most of those people are going to come from nine countries. And those nine countries are India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Indonesia, the DRC, the United States. So other than the United States, we're essentially going to add 2 billion it's mostly poor people, mostly in Africa, and a bit in Central Asia. So by 2050, Africa will be 25% of the world. At the same time, the US and China, which today are 42% of global GDP, by 2050, we don't know exactly, but it'll be something north of 50%, maybe as much as 60%. So concentration of wealth among the two most powerful wealthy countries gets more concentrated and you get many, many more poor people. We know what that world looks like because we're living it right now, the world of income inequality, wealth inequality, across countries, within countries. And so I ask the rhetorical question, in that world, the world I just described in 2050, who thinks it's a good idea that the most powerful countries in the world, whether it's the most powerful 10, the most powerful five, let alone the most powerful two, who thinks it's a good idea that the two most powerful countries in the world I just described should spend most of their time fighting with each other? That can't make any sense of any kind in any world. So then I start asking myself, well, how is this going to be, get recalibrated? Because I certainly know the toxic environment in my own country very well, and it's very toxic. And the relationship between the US and China is very unconstructive. In fact, at a time when we need maximum communication, we have almost no communication. Again, I'm fond of playing the game in my head. If you were to ask Joe Biden's cabinet, person by person, tell me the name of your counterpart in China. Most of them couldn't tell you. And if you ask them on a scale of one to 10, grade your relationship with your counterpart in China. That would be zero. Just think about that for a second. Now, then I start saying to myself, okay, so where is hope going to come from? And I say to myself, well, there are many other countries in the world that have their own interest in relation to the United States in relation to China. And I know from my business experience that when you talk to the prime ministers or the presidents or the heads of states of these various countries, 100% of them will say, do not make us choose. We don't want to choose between the United States and China. We want to have good relationships with both. Of course, that's just common sense. You'd think that the US and China could figure this out on their own. But that's true. They do not want to be forced to choose. And so I thought to myself, over time, maybe, just maybe, these countries will make their views known forcefully enough to the United States and China that those two countries will realize it's simply unacceptable to the world that the two most powerful countries do not have a good relationship. We don't have the luxury of that. We've got enough real problems, we don't need to manufacture problems. So then I come to, to today's forum, 
And I think to myself, there can be no better named forum, Asia New Vision, Vision Forum, and no better time for this forum. Because if you saw last night, uh, or you may have seen over, over, the, over the evening, uh, Fareed Zakaria and one of his famous uh, so-called Fareed's take just yesterday, the title of it was, the rest of the world doesn't see China the way we do, talking to the American audience. And then he goes on to talk about the world, and in particular, he talks about this part of the world, and in particular, he cites Kishore, and he says, Kishore makes a number of very, very compelling points. One of the compelling points is that the trade between ASEAN and China is now bigger than the trade between the United States and the EU. In fact, it's the biggest trading bloc in the world. And so, as the world is changing, and I have now been involved with this part of the world for 35 years, and I was here during the Asian financial crisis, so I've seen on the ground in real, term, in real time what happens here. And, and my message is, I'm hoping that this forum and others will raise the self-awareness among people in this part of the world that we need you to be actively wanting to define the future. No longer be kind of the recipients of, as it were, the wisdom of others, but rather take hold of the future yourself and help define it and drive it. Because I'm very confident if that's the case, the world will be better off for it. The US and China will realize that they've got to build a constructive relationship and the whole world will be, will be in a better place. So my one plea for this group is, when you leave two days from now, please leave thinking to yourself, I've got a responsibility to help define the future. And with that, I'll turn it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you.